Why do you edit it? Shut up. <laughs> we'll talk about it after. <laughs> You know what? I'm not going to edit it. I'm going to leave this in in going our interview starts with Jill Rafting on me. You should be outsourcing this shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jill Stanton, I should. <laughs> Okay, so the reason I do it is because when I do it and I do the intro at the same time, it's literally an extra three to four minutes to put it together. So I'm like, well, I'll take the three to four minutes instead of sending it off to someone else and bothering them. Yeah, Yeah, right? Uploading, exporting, all the things. Yes, yes. I would just rather do it, but I know. Okay, so this is all about you. (laughs) My favorite days. So the screw is what you are known for. How long has that been going? We started that in 2012 on our wedding week. No, we had the idea for it in 2012 on our wedding week, which is probably like the one week you shouldn't be working. But like we were just so new in the game at that point. Josh had, um, we were all in on our business for that first year. He had a previous business before that. I had a previous business before that, but together this was our first year. And so we're out on the balcony, like our wedding guests were coming the next day or something. And we're having some rum. It was Costa Rica. We're listening to Bob Marley. (coughs) And we were a couple weeks away from moving to Thailand at the time in early 2013. And (laughs) they have a big entrepreneur community there. And so we were talking about like, we should document this because we were starting to get a lot of questions around what we were doing, right? Because, you know, we weren't working jobs. We were traveling heaps. We were making money on the internet. People were like, what, what's happening here? Like, what's going on? You drug dealers? Like, what are you doing? (laughs) Um, And so Josh- I mean, you were in Costa Rica. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's not, it's not not accurate. (laughs) Um, and Josh was saying, you know, we should start a website to like keep our friends and family in the loop and blah, blah. I was like, that's a great idea. He's like, what would we call it? And I'm like, Costa Rica rum. And I was like, screw the nine to five. <laughs> and both of us were like, oh, I wonder if that's available. And we grabbed it and we locked it in and we kind of sat on it because we had never built personal brands before. Like we didn't know what we were, we didn't know what we were doing. At that point, we had a bunch of affiliate sites like skincare sites and beauty sites and personal hygiene and supplements and high heels. And none of it was branded to our names. We wrote under a pen name. I did some videos and stuff and pictures, but um, none of it was like us on the line, like putting yeah. ourselves out there. Uh, so we didn't even know what the heck to do. And if you look back to the early days of the skirt, I think we've hidden a lot of the like nonsense posts we ran, but it was like <laughs> lessons from the coach. Koh Tao Mafia, which is an island in Thailand we were living on there, how to get traffic from Pinterest or how to work with your significant other. It was all over the place. There was no strategy whatsoever because we didn't know what we were doing. Um, And so in 2013, we're like, let's start, let's create a course. (laughs) And what should we make it? And we're like, guest blogging, because definitely people want to learn that from us. Turns out no one did because we it sold no, sound that sexy. no courses, <laughs> zero dollars. I ugly cried for 24 hours straight, no joke. And that was the best thing that ever happened to us yeah. at that point. Of course. And so what was the turning point with it when you were going, you know, you're running around the world and you you finished ugly crying and then went, yeah. okay, I'm going to try again. Was the next yeah. one the success or did you have a few iterations before you were like, okay, now this is on a winner? Yeah. So that was the biggest lesson at the time because we created what we thought they wanted. And it was the most pivotal lesson we could have learned because it's like, oh no, no, no. What do they think they need? And so we were like, well, a lot of people ask us how to make money online, huh? Ding. (laughs) And how do we make money online? Affiliate marketing. And that's the question we get all the time. And so then we put out a, a email to our newsletter saying like, this is now our new focus. We're going to start teaching affiliate marketing and how we make money online and travel everywhere. And if you want to stay in our world, like we'd love to have you. And if not, like totally cool, we understand, but we're going this way now. Um, and most people stuck around and then we launched our next course after that, pre-sold it, <laughs> eh? Um made a whole $4,000. Yeah. (laughs) Nice Um, work. (laughs) And then we're like, yes, we didn't lose 5,000. Like we did the first one. Um, and then launched that, got some results with it and then, uh, opened it back up when we had the course created, did another 4,000, then did our first webinar and did 8,000. And then we're like, 
are we Oprah rich right now? Because I think we are. <laughs> it was just like, and then it was like game on. Yes. Um, and it's just been, that was 2014. And it's been a seven year process of ups and downs. And I love that. Figuring out I, I had a similar experience when I did my first proper like live launch for the seven days. And I did $11,000 and finished and going, oh my gosh, this is going to be a million dollar company. Like this is amazing because I could see how leveraged and scalable it was. Um, but what I find is working with a lot of people is they have a launch that's $5,000 or $10,000 for their first one or two. And they're devastated because they see all the massive numbers and they're really disappointed. But every single person I know that is successful in courses has our exact story in going, yeah. you know, we had this small launch and we were like, oh my God. It wasn't a question of if, it's when, and we knew we were on a winner. How, like, what's been your experience with that? Because you talk to a lot of people at the beginning level of course creation as well. I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> In case, oh no, my my necklace fell off. Sorry. This is how animated I am. I'm just going <laughs> to leave it. It's, I have a shag rug and it's now just. It's gone into the abyss. Um, yeah. I have a lot to say about that. So I work, like you said, in Screw the 9 to 5, we work with a lot of um, up and coming course creators and a lot of them experience that. So they make like 500 bucks or a thousand or 2000 or 5,000 or whatever it is. And they think they should be further ahead by, by that point, right? Because that's what is sold. That's the like our space, this online business, online marketing space is so uh, declarative. And it's like, if you don't do this, you're shit. And if you don't do this, you're bad. And if you don't do this, you're failing. Um, and so a lot of people get in their head around that and they make it mean, oh, clearly I'm not cut out for this because I only made 500 bucks or a thousand or whatever it is. Right. But the way I talk to our clients and, and our members is like, what if that is your current capacity level though? Like, what if that is a um, perfect sign that you need to like, okay, cool. My energetic and operational capacity right now is, you know, $2,000 worth of customers. Mm. And what can I do and who can I become to increase my capacity, right? Because you don't have to go from like 2000 to 20 to 200,000 right? That can be really unsustainable for a lot of people because yeah. one, they don't have the systems in place. They don't have the team in place. They don't know how to handle or hold space. You do see that, for that people many have people. these Bonza launches, spending a bucket load of money on Facebook advertising, and then they go and just disappear. Yeah. 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 How many times have we seen people come and go out of this space? They come yeah. in, make a huge splash, think they're killing it. And then they're gone because yeah. they can't handle the heat, the ups and downs. Yeah. Right. The stresses and the successes. Yes. Right. A lot of people are worried about failure, but just as many people are actually worried about the success. Like how will I know what to do? Or what if people come after me for money? Or what if they think I'm greedy or I'm all about the money or I'm conceited or I'm selfish or I'm full of myself or whatever it is. And they stack all these what ifs when really you could just like honor where you're at. And I don't want to, I hesitate to put like, make it good enough, but like be happy with it be present to it and use it as a, like a jumping off point to go to the next level. Okay, great. I now know my energetic set point. This is one thing you and I have talked about in a lot of our conversations, like your energetic set point is now $2,000 with launches. I now know how to make $2,000 with launches. So that is my minimum set point, right? Um, or my energetic minimum. Well, what do I have to do and who do I have to become to make four? Okay, cool. That's now my energetic set point. What do I do and who do I have to become to make eight and then 16 and then 32 and then 64 and then 128 and then <laughs> 256. I'm going to stop. <laughs> but you know what yeah. I mean? Like you just, you baby step. It's micro wins, micro actions, micro growth. Yeah. So many people think it has to be big and sexy. But yes. it's steady growth that really wins in the long run. Yeah. Okay. So I have like all my questions. The hard part about you is I go, okay, that leads into that question. But mm -hmm. I still want to circle back and get my original question in because if I don't, I never will. Um, in going, so you're Canadian. Josh is Australian. Mm -hmm. You traveled the world at the beginning. How did you two meet? And how did you get into what you were doing online in the first place? Yeah. Whenever people ask me this, Josh always goes, do you want the short version or do you want the long version? <laughs> and now he's not here. So F it. I'm telling my version. <laughs> so 
um, back in 2009, when we met, I was moving to Australia. I was in web TV at that time. This again, 2009, I started my first web TV show in 2006, the days of MySpace and when like YouTube just got sold to Google. Yeah, so That's you were how- always going to be in the <laughs> internet. Yeah. It's like when people were not watching internet yeah. TV, thankfully, because it was still the time where you could erase shit off the internet because I admitted a lot of things because I had a show on dating, sex, and relationships. Oh, and shit. I had a lot of fun in my 20s. So I'm like real happy you could delete that off the <laughs> internet at that point. But anywho, I was moving to Australia with a girlfriend of mine to do another web TV show that was sponsored by the Gold Coast Tourism Board and a bunch of other companies. Um, and I had met Josh's at that time, business partner and his now wife, and they were living in Canada for a year. And we connected through a mutual friend and they were like, oh, you should meet our friend, Josh. She's coming to town for, I think it was like three weeks and I'm single and I was moving to Australia. So I was like, well, is Josh hot? <laughs> we're like, don't even bother. He's bachelor for life. He's never had a girlfriend. And I was like, sounds perfect. I'll meet him. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we got in there. And so now you've been going through the screw for a long time. And then last year was when you stepped out and started creating the Millionaire Girls Club on your own to go, oh, I'm going to find it. wasn't even last year, this year. It was, I had the, well, I had the idea. And first off, can I just say, when I met Josh, I picked him up. So he was living in Beijing, China at that time, running his programming team. And I picked him up for dinner with, uh, this other couple and he walked out in like cobalt blue jeans and red black and white plaid shirt and I was like what the hell and I was like hey Josh I'm also four years older than him so I was just like oh my god this kid and <laughs> so I was like 28 at the time he was 23 um I was like hey Josh and he's like oh good day and I was like Josh is so hot <laughs> but he wouldn't he wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't sit beside me. He wouldn't sit across from me. He sat diagonal and ignored me the whole time. And I was like, must have. Yeah. And that was, that was really the start of it. He finally gave me the time of day, like towards the end of dinner. And then from there, I mean, he flew to Vegas to meet me for three days. I moved to Australia. He showed up on my doorstep and that was, I mean, that? we've been together ever since. Yeah. So going back to MGC, sorry, I just had to put a bow on this because again, yeah. I'm the long long storyteller. Yeah, um, I so I actually had the idea for MGC, which is Millionaire Girls Club back in 2019. And honest to God, like if I'm being really real and fully honest, like I sat on that idea because I was way too scared of it because um, Millionaire Girls Club is, I mean, you know, we work together, is focused on um, serving and connecting high caliber women who are at the million dollar plus mark and connecting them with other badass women. And I had a very um, strained and tumultuous experience with female friendships. And I know a lot of women can relate to that. Um, And I had like a decade long experience of just being like mercilessly bullied. And so for me to hold space and step out into that arena to be like, oh, cool. Now I'm going to like create a business serving women, like just triggered all the wounds, all the sister wounds, all the fears, all the like, just everything I had in myself. And so it took me two years to finally say yes to it. And I finally said to Josh, like, I'm going to do this last October or November. um, And I launched in January. And I'm so So. glad that you did. (laughs) (laughs) And so what is like, what's the goal with that? What's the big picture? Luxury retreats for badass women at the million dollar mark. I, I don't know if you can vibe with this tea, but I, I know you, so I feel like you can, it's like, as you are at that level, or as you reach or cross that level, like Mm. the bigger you get, the smaller your circle gets, Mm. right? Because there's less women who really understand Mm. um, the sacrifices, the inner work, the Mm. inner work you have to do, um, who you have to become, all that you have to manage, right? Because it's not just business. If you're a mom or a wife, like there's that invisible workload as well. Yeah. Right. Like all the other things we manage and all the other space we hold for the people in our lives. Like it's not just work. Right. And so not a lot of people get that. And so they're like, oh, that's just Tina yeah. doing her little internet thing. You're like, say what? I make a million plus a year. Like, no. Um, and so my intention is to create luxury, badass, rich AF experiences for those women 
who don't always take that time for themselves, mm. right? Because if they are going to do vacations or retreats, well, I should probably do it with my family, yeah. right? Like I don't really take that much time off. So I should probably make time to do that with my family or they just don't have the capacity to plan something like that. And yeah. so I was like, well, I oh want to I cannot wait. If, if want, Australia does not let me on a plane, <laughs> I will get out my kayak and I will start paddling. In a tube. <laughs> Yeah, I'll <laughs> swim the whole way. Um, now you said something there that I, <laughs> I'm going, I'm going, I'm hoping this will tip off like one of one of the the epic Jill rants that I absolutely <laughs> live for, um, is the the inner work and and you know doing the things that are hard and putting in the effort with it. And I love your kind of what I'm trying to get across. So I know your answer to this but the way that you put it so eloquently is it's kind of going and this is this is why I have to ask you the question is because clearly I can't put it eloquently is going mm -hmm. you take the hard work and doing the things that nobody else is doing but still also hold that feeling of of ease and doing that and mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's misinterpreted by people coming into the online game in going we see all these people saying you know what if it was easy and take the past of path of least resistance and and manifest it and, and do all of those different things and then think that that's in the absence of actually doing the work and yeah. taking the risk and then they feel like if they're working too much they're doing the wrong thing but you still got to get it off the ground um, so can you give me your eloquent answer with how you balance the two of those I don't know one successful person that hasn't put in hard yards and massive action and a massive amount of work, especially in the beginning. Like mm. anyone who is telling you that yeah. you can just be like easy and you'll make a million dollars. Like that is just nonsense. And I feel like they're trying to sell you something, right? Yeah. But it's like a rocket. I'm sure everyone's heard this analogy. Like it uses like 90% or 80% of its fuel to even get off the ground. View you starting your business and getting your first million or even your first hundred grand. Mm as that like you put in massive action because yes intention visualizations dreams goals cool that initiates everything you want but it's action that init or that enables the reception of it so yes you can be woo and manifest and all that kind of stuff but if you aren't taking action aligned action inspired action to go along with that well then you're not going to get very far and here's another thing i want to say about that is there's there's taking action and then there's like forcing, yeah. right? And I get it because forcing is the energy of like, it's not gonna work or what if, what if it doesn't work? What if I fail? That's forcing, that's an energy of not having, right? But you can take inspired action or um, just massive action in service of going where you wanna go, but it not being out of a desperate energy of like, this might not happen for me. Instead, it's an energy of like, I'm working towards something that really matters to me. I'm taking action in service of who I want to become and what I want to create and what I want to do and what I want to experience. That is totally different. Like want and um, embodied is like an energy of not having. I want this, but the underlying energy is like, I don't have it. And the energy of like, I am the type of person who has blah, 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 or who does this and that, or who experienced this. That's an energy of like, it's on its way or it's coming or I'm calling it in or I already have it, right? It's two very different things. The focus is different and it doesn't seem like a big deal, but un underneath it all, it's everything. Mm. Like when you say, I want to make a million dollars, but underneath it, you're like, I don't actually have a million dollars and that's where your focus is. Well, then that's all you're perpetuating because the universe is like, oh, cool. You want that? Great. I'm going to keep giving you experiences or circumstances to uh just perpetuate the not having of it mm. does that make sense like it seems so subtle and it is but it's also everything does that make sense yeah completely and then I think because I you know you know my thoughts on hard work Jill <laughs> <laughs> but then I we're, think we're, you're getting better though you're getting I, so much better I am and that is thanks to you and all of our conversations around boundaries and that's kind of where I want to get to the next stage is going you're working with women kind of that next level up as well in going 
there has to be an off switch. And I think one of the best things that you said to me was, you know, because I came from zero dollars, I had to pay for everything with my time. And so I was very used to working harder. And you're like, you have the choice. You can pay for it with your time or your money. You now have the mm-hmm. money, take back your time and use the mm-hmm. money. How do you, how, what's your advice to people where they're at that level, where they're kind of growing and then they're getting to the point where they're reaching that burnout and that overwhelm and going, hang on, but I don't want to take my foot off the accelerator because I don't want the business to suffer, but I know I'm going to end up burnt out. Like how do you, it's such a tricky line. Well, that conversation was for anyone listening was Tina and I were talking about, she's always built everything organically, which is amazing because what you've created is bonkers to have done that organically. I'm just like, I bow down. Uh, what I was very happy. You, I spent $600 on ads this week, a whole 600. <laughs> I mean, I'll take it momentarily and then let's up it a bit. <laughs> um, so what we were talking about is Tina was gearing up for her next launch. And I was saying like, how many people do you want to get in your challenge? She's like, well, typically I get this many. And I was like, okay, cool. So how can we like double that? And she's like, well, I guess I could do this and this. And I was like, no. You go to the traffic store and you buy yourself some traffic, i.e. Facebook ads or IG, right? Like you, you can pay, like Tina was saying, with your time or your money. There's two currencies in business. Yeah. And when you get to a certain level, you can only effort so much, Yeah. right? Because you have a team and people to take care of and customers to take care of and a podcast issue. And, you know, there's just other things that you deal with at a higher level that you just didn't have to think about at a lower level when it was just you with your moxie making shit happen, yeah. right? And so at a certain level, you have to be like, okay, who do I want to be? Do I want to hustle and grind and do all these podcast interviews for other shows that don't really have audiences because you know I'm a hustler or do we want to be more leveraged with our time and our boundaries and our energy and buy our way in front of people get in front of very targeted people who have intent to purchase and focus our energy there versus I have 23 podcast interviews this week and it's all with shows that have, you know, I don't know who you could possibly be using as an example right now, Jill. (laughs) (laughs) You, Tina. (laughs) That me. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know what? Like, I still think there's merit in doing that at the beginning. For me, it was very much yes. realizing, you know, what what got me here won't get me there. And yes. I've now got to this stage. And, you know, I think like when the book hit the bestseller list, I was like, you know what? That is because I was everywhere. I hustled my 100%. way onto everything. It was mass exposure, probably too much. And now I have to realize, okay, boundaries. How do we create well, those and go to that next level? And what we're saying is in the beginning, yes, that is necessary. Yeah. It's the rocket. That's how you get it off the ground. That's yeah. how you get in front of people, right? Yeah. But at the level you're at, like there are certain things that you can be like, I'm so grateful for these opportunities. Thank you. And I'm ready for bigger now. And yeah. so now I'm going to start saying no to the smaller things in order to make space for the bigger things to come in. And when you did that, look at how many things started flowing into your life, right? Because you were like, okay, cool. I'm so grateful for what has come into my experience up to this point. I appreciate all of it. And I'm ready to go to the next level now. And so I will do podcast interviews or whatever, but at this level. Yeah. So you get to do less, but it's, you know, I don't want to say worth more, but like a bigger impact Yeah, in front of more people. Yeah. And what's your advice to women with boundaries? Because I know that so many women are people pleasing and suffer Mm -hmm. from that. And it's something that I really admire that you have is going, you know, you, you will connect with people, you will do the things, but if it's not like an absolutely hell yeah, you're Mm -hmm. like, you know what, I just don't have time for that. And with the same thing with the growth, when women get to a certain level, like doing it and responding to all of the like social media comments and messages and and saying yes when people say hey can I pick your brain for something or can we have a quick chat how have you done that while still being able to maintain or not feel like you're now withdrawing too much from people here's the thing I'm always trying to get better like I don't have it completely figured out I'm never going to pretend that I do I still struggle with boundaries like absolutely if someone was once a customer and they're like I'm launching a new show will you do it I'm like (laughs) 
damn it. And I usually <laughs> say, just like circle back to me in a couple months once it's launched. Yeah. Um, so I still have room for improvement. Of course, like I'm just a human who is just on the journey, just like everyone else. Here's the thing I will say about people pleasing though. It's your, um, you, when you sit in an energy of people pleasing, you are trying to control how people view you or experience you. It is done from a place of conditioning and programming and from what you experienced in, you know, earlier years. If you grew up with authority figures who always put their needs before yours or were who taught you to do that in order to receive love or attention, of course, that is going to be how you operate until you become aware of it, right? And for me, I had to undo a lot of that, not necessarily from my parents, but I had some very strained female relationships and not even relationships, interactions, right? Mm -hmm. Where... I was just very, it was very humiliating, degrading experiences. And so I learned from a very young age, because it started when I was around nine, um, to just like, not be too much, not be too big, not be too loud, not be too seen, right? And in case you can't tell, I'm a very demonstrative person. So it really, like, I had to minimize myself. I had to hide. I never wore makeup. I wore bulky sweaters. I really tried to, like, not blend. I tried to blend in. Um, And so in my experience with business, up until I would say I had my son, truthfully, and Josh was working with a coach at that time, Jim Fortin, and I would listen to their coaching replays for the ones that he was cool with me listening to. And I remember Jim pointing out to Josh a fear of judgment. And I was like, fear of judgment. And I listened to it, and it was like, you are trying to control how people experience you. And I was like, holy shit, that's all I've ever done. Like really trying to like stay safe, not be talked about because that was just so my reality for years with like not knowing who's safe, um, not knowing who will leave you, not knowing who will stab you in the back, not knowing who will abandon you, all of that kind of stuff. And so I very much muted or maybe overcompensated yeah. who I was in an effort to like keep people at an arm's distance. And when I started realizing like how much of a fear of judgment I actually had, and then had my son on top of that, well, it's just like a quantum leap in zero F-ness, right? Because I was like, I no longer give an F about this, 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 like we made huge shifts in our business. I felt like I shed a bunch of relationships that no longer serve me, stopped saying yes to a lot of things. Like I just became much more focused on who I wanted to be and less apologetic for it. Um, And I feel like so many women specifically, especially right now, like with social media, social media is like 24 seven outrage, right? We're watching people get canceled, called out, all of this stuff torn apart. And people are like, I don't want any of that, right? That's frightening to me. And so we mute ourselves, we play small, we try to blend in because we associate that person's opinion or truth with the truth about us, but their opinion doesn't matter. And what I'm trying to get women to realize is like, what happens if we start prioritizing self-approval first over outside approval? What would your life look like? What would you, what would you release? What would you stop worrying about? What would you stop stressing over? What would you allow into your life if you no longer worried? What if, what if this person says this? What, what are people going to say about me? If, what if someone sees me fail? Cause that's really what it is. It's not like, what if I fail? It's yeah. like, what if someone sees me fail? Oh my God, what will they think about me? What does that mean about me? Internalizing their truth as the truth. And instead it's flipping it and becoming less interested in what other people think about you and prioritizing what you think about you, because how would you love yourself if you loved yourself the way you love others? Mm. How would you treat yourself if you treated yourself the way you treat others? Think about that first and then start realizing what am I willing to hold space for? What will I say yes to from now on? What will I say no to? Mm. What will I no longer allow or be available for? Those, it's that's something that I think just sounds a whole new level so of easy. Like when you say yeah. it, you're like, oh my gosh, it feels so freeing even when you say it. And mm-hmm. it sounds so easy, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, it's, it's true. probably exactly what you just said then is what I have worked on for like the last year solid and still going, 
oh my gosh, like, how am I in this situation? Um, it is, it's, it's so much easier said than done. Yeah, for sure. I feel like that's everything with personal growth though, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's why it's so scary to ask yourself, what do I really want? Yeah. What do I really want? Yeah. Because once you answer that, well, now you have two choices. One, go after it, yeah. right? Go to bat for who you want to be, what you want to create, what you want to do, what you want to have, what you want to experience or stay the same mm. and suffer the like pain of that stagnation, yeah. that awareness of this is not what I want, but I'm too fucking scared. Oh, sorry. I'm too scared. Yeah, <laughs> Oh, I'm okay. surprised well, this is the I'm first time scared. you've done it. I'm like, what? <laughs> but I'm too scared to go after it. Yeah. That is painful. Yeah. Right? And it's much more painful than this painful of going for it. Yeah. Because a lot of people, we just don't want to be seen. Right? So many of us are, we're scared of being seen for who we really are. We're scared of being seen for our weaknesses or who we think we're not. Mm -hmm. We're scared of being seen uh, for starting small, mm. right? How many people want to start a business, but they're like, I just don't want people to see me starting small. Yes, 100%. That was I big for like me with MGC. This is what I'm coming back with, with the, with the launches when people start from the beginning and they're ashamed to go, you know, I just had someone um, in, in my mastermind that started her podcast and she's like, I put my first episode out and I had only 28 downloads. I don't think I'm going to keep going. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what? That was, it's brand new. And you had 28 people on day one, pick it up and put you in their ears. Like that is yeah. amazing. And everyone starts from zero. And I think, I think social media has a lot to play in that in going. Yeah. And I think also like, yes, there's some amazing stories, but I also think a lot of people lie also. <laughs> oh, bro. No, I feel like I know a lot of people. In yeah. Space. And sometimes and a lot you of the, see the numbers you see. and you're like, mm, yeah. is that, is that true? Like, may I please see I a remember, screenshot? <laughs> I remember I was at a, a big event with some real key player and to see them just with their guards down being their actual selves. I was like, oh, this is such a good reminder. Yeah. This is such a good reminder that none of us have it figured out that none of us, like it's real easy to have the highlight reel. Mm. But what I'm after is the highlight reel R E A L. Yeah. Yeah. Living in that. Yeah. That is what people want. No, let's keep it real. Like how many of us who doesn't vibe with perfect? Like I don't vibe with perfect. I want to, I want real, I want resonance. Yeah. That's what people, they want to resonate with you. And what if we just start prioritizing that when building our businesses, getting our podcasts out there? What if we're like, cool, vanity metrics aside, I did it. Yeah. Or I had 28 people raise their hand and be like, that sounds like a great episode. Right. And like, yeah. let's keep it real. First episode is probably like, why I'm starting this show. And people are like, I don't get can you yeah. launch episode two already? <laughs> right. Like, I don't care why you're starting the show. Bring me the good shit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so like first episode, like that's your first at bat. Yeah. So you're just never going to play baseball again because you struck out on your first yeah. go? Like, no. It's the hey, same. I did a up. live webinar once and I had nobody show up and it got like three minutes in and I was like, oh, this, this is, this is not looking good. And then I thought, <laughs> you know what? Fuck it. I don't want someone to come on. Like if they come on at 20 minutes and I'm either not there or it looks like, so I ran the entire thing like it was a live audience thinking that mm. I was like having a good practice. Anyway, nobody did come on. <laughs> but a year but later, I hit a million dollars. And I think that that is, I know. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people think that that's not acceptable or when they do that, it's an indication that they're on the wrong path and they shouldn't be doing mm. it. When really I just had to figure out you know, I totally bodged the entire promotion. I didn't know about all of the 50 gazillion emails to send that people needed as reminders beforehand. Yeah. Like all of those things were lessons learned. And now my show up rate is fabulous, but I didn't know that at the start. And that's the lessons we have to learn. Dude, how else are you supposed to know what works if you don't know what doesn't? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my final question that I have for you, because you have been running these millionaire mixes, which, you know, you're getting together these powerhouse women to just shoot the breeze and talk about business and do that, which is like the most amazing thing. And I, and you guys, I have begged Jill to do them as a paid, she won't, she won't do it because she's boundaried and I love her for that, but I'm also frustrated. (laughs) Because then I'll have to do them consistently and And I just like want to do it when I want to do it. My retreat's filling anyways. I'm just like, people are coming out of the woodwork. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah, of course. When you talked about it, I was like, what? There's zero doubt that it will fill, like zero. Mm -hmm. Um, But my question is, you've spoken to a lot of women at that seven-figure level this year. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you see that they're doing that other people aren't? What's setting them apart? In our work. Always. Always. Boundaries, inner work worth work mm. um, and releasing control yeah. I would say that is such a big one working on continuously releasing control mm. how many of us have a vice grip on how something should be done <laughs> <laughs> <Hands up. laughs> <In this> podcast. <laughs> what control what you talking about I don't know I have no issue with control <laughs> as long as everyone does it exactly my way <laughs> Have no issues with control as long as you stay in your lane and do exactly what you're told. <laughs> and five minutes early, too. <laughs> yes. Um, that is definitely, and I would say like working on their relationships is definitely one that comes up a lot. Is you know, I have a you know, insert whatever relationship here. There's either some friction or things are great but it's taken a lot of work to get there because especially if your significant other is not an entrepreneur, like there's friction there, especially if they're like, why are you working so much? And then shouldn't you be working? (laughs) Yeah. It messes with a lot of women, right? Why are you working so much? You barely have time for us. Because my, my husband is like, does not have a shred of ambition in him. Like, I got. I hope he doesn't listen to this. I got no. He will say it openly. Like I got more in my pinky toe than he has, like in his whole body. Totally unapologetically, he. I love him because he is the most contented, easygoing man. I think on the on the planet and oh. I often talk to friends that have they're both super ambitious and I think that mm. would be really hard because Matt's always going for me like when I want to go to conferences and when I want to go to different things he's like yeah you go I'll surf this sounds great and we never have like the competing priorities which is so great. much easier I just from my personal experience and personal conversations with a lot of chicks not everyone has an easy breezy partner like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so a lot of people also have experiences where their significant other feels like they're ignoring them or that they get the worst of them. Or, I mean, it's kind of like a push and pull. I've had that comment many times in going, you know, like, especially with the performing of the nature of the work that we do when we're live presenting and doing that. And he's like, you know, you get, everyone gets all your energy, all the best for you. And then I can be so deflated at the end of the day that I go in home and I'm just like, oh, give me the snuggie. Give me the lounge. Like, (laughs) oh God, the (laughs) woodcutter. the termite <laughs> yeah I will share that joke so people know what we're talking about there there's nothing worse than when people have in jokes and you're like what um so my snuggie my husband nicknamed <laughs> the termite because it kills wood <laughs> yeah it's very comfortable <laughs> we've got off track I would wear it all the time if I had a Snuggie. Like yeah. That. I mean, I'm in the Cayman Islands, so it'd be hot AF. But yeah. if not, I would wear it all the time. Yeah, same. And anytime I, he I would did. bring you coffee, I'd be like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so with that, like, I do think that, you know, that's been one of the really interesting learnings of me is there there was, I mean, why I first um, engaged you as my coach was for that exact reason was going, I was getting to the end of every day zero energy and going, Mm. I've given everything I've got. And I was like perpetually 
tired and exhausted and couldn't see, I was going, okay, so I've got the, the million and a half a year business now. If I want to get it to 5 million, I can't work five times yeah. harder. Like I am done. I am spent. What do I do yeah. here? I know how to run this level business. I do not r- know how to run that level business. And that was so much of what I had to learn was how to they get that energy and conserve that so that all the parts of my life can still get the best of that. And that's something, you know, that I think is going to take me another good 12 months to really work through and edge out. And I don't know, you, you really integrate quite quickly. Like you've made some big strides in oh, yeah. such a, a short amount of time. Like you're real coachable. Like that's one thing that I just love about you is you're, there's a lot of people who'll be like, yeah, I know, but, and you're like, no, you don't know. <laughs> you know you'll be doing it. <laughs> yeah. But you're very open and coachable. You have a lot of just like, you don't take anything personally. And so mm-hmm. I don't know if it will take you 12 months. Like it could be real quick for you. You know, you've realized, oh, okay. My energy is limited. My capacity is limited. Mm-hmm. I need to start paying more people to do more things to take my load off so that I can make better decisions. I can show up and serve my audience, my customers, right? Like you have to start taking stock of what are the levels of priority in your business? One customers, right? They should get the best of you because right? they're paying you money. And then other things that don't need to be done by you, email scheduling, <coughs> podcast editing, um, <laughs> things like this, like low level ten dollar an hour tasks yeah. don't need to be done by you and there you get energy back it's like josh my my husband um not for you just for anyone watching you're like oh really josh is your husband <laughs> but josh talked about it as like as your like life your um excuse me like your life meter in super mario you know how you like lose lives and if you're doing too much as an entrepreneur it, like cuts down your life yes. like there are certain and then you have to go get more lives but the way you get more lives is by handing things off. I or, love that you know, analogy. Only focusing on the things that move the needle for you. Yeah. And then releasing the things that do not move the needle or other people can do that allows you to have just a more leveraged stance. And he talked about this a lot because he was at an event where Mike Michalowicz spoke. And he was saying, like, so many of us get trapped in um, the cycle of like wanting to be the CEO, like, ooh, ah. I'm the CEO. And he's like, how many CEOs do you know who work like crazy or who are still energy zapped or miserable? It's not about being the CEO. It's about being the shareholder, allowing your business to run for you, allowing it to make money for you. You kind of like sitting back doing your thing, having an easier lifestyle, more time so you can make better decisions and still get paid. Uh, So it's about that critical shift of not needing to do everything and allow empowering people to take it off your plate and allowing them to make mistakes so that they can get better so that they can learn what not to do and therefore what to do and how to do it even better. I love it. Jill, Mm -hmm. thank you. And thank you. Um, I'm sure everyone has just loved having you in their ears. (laughs) Understands my (laughs) deep love affair with you now. Uh, You're amazing. Uh, All of your information is straight under the bottom, but I would say like hit you up on Instagram, but you're kind of (laughs) <laughs> avoiding it a little bit which is another boundary thing which I love <laughs> for a long time I was like I need to do social media I need to do social media and then I was like do I do I really if it's not a needle mover which is not for us mm. do I need to do it the answer is no so I, I have it and I talk to people in dms and sometimes I do stories like I documented my whole hurricane experience um but yeah like you can dm me for sure I it might take it. a few days to re- respond but <laughs> I'll check you out, but I'll say hi. (laughs) Thank you, Jill. Thanks, T.